sermon this morning is, as Vicar Weekman had mentioned, or I guess you didn't mention, but you did read uh, the gospel lesson. That's going to serve as our text today. And uh, you didn't mention it because I didn't tell you to. I should make that point as well. But we're going to focus on Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Let us pray. Lord, as we witness you through the words of Luke's gospel, as we witness you battle the Lord or the devil head on, please help us to see your reliance on the written word of God and how that same word dwelling richly in our hearts can bring the power and victory over the devil and over all temptations. Strengthen us through word and sacrament to follow you and to follow your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, dear fellow redeemed, on this very first Sunday of the season of Lent, you may have noticed already in the bulletin that today's sermon is entitled, Lent is for Life, Not Just for Chocolate. Now, I didn't come up with that title. I saw it, and so I borrowed it because it fit so well with today's message. Because what do a lot of people do during the season of Lent? They give something up. In recognition of the suffering and the death that Jesus endured for us, some people decide to give up for Lent something in order to help them focus on our Lord's suffering. And that something that is often given up usually has to do with food. Some people give, give up eating out for, for, for the 40 days of Lent. Some people refrain from eating meat on Fridays. Some might even give up chocolate for Lent or some other treat. And some even go on a complete fast for 40 days, patterned after our Lord's fasting in the desert while he was tempted by Satan. Now, can that idea of giving something up for Lent be abused? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that because we're giving something up that somehow that makes us better Christians than others who don't give anything up. Or that by giving something up we are earning God's favor and our salvation by giving something up for Lent. Instead, those sacrifices that we might make should remind us of what Jesus gave up, his very life to save us. That's why we can say, with all sincerity and humility, that Lent is for life, not just for chocolate. Now, having said that, let's assume that we are giving something up with the proper attitude so that we can focus more on Christ during this season. What would you be willing to give up? What pleasure might you deny yourself in recognition of what Christ gave up to save you? Dining out? Meat on Fridays? Chocolate? Well, let's consider that question after we've had some opportunity to look at our Lord's temptations there in the wilderness to see if it has any bearing then on the answer that we might give. In the very opening words of our text, it reads, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Now, let's avoid uh, uh, not jumping right into the temptations and risk missing some very important information that our text provides about these temptations. There in verse 2, we heard that the Holy Spirit actually led Jesus into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Sometimes when we read this account, it may seem as if all of this took place in a single afternoon. That's how long it may have taken for the three recorded temptations to have taken place. But how long did the temptation last? Forty days. Those three temptations 
that we have recorded in our gospel lesson came at the end of the 40 days. So they tell of the temptations that Satan used when Jesus was at his weakest after he had been fasting for 40 days. Did you catch that? Jesus had gone without food for 40 days. That's over a month. And notice what it says, uh, our text says, at the end of the temptations, he was hungry. Now there's an understatement if there ever was one. You and I will often get grumpy if we miss one meal. Jesus missed 120 meals. So what I want you to understand what's going on here is that Jesus was starving. And I don't mean that he was starving like we're starving when we miss lunch or dinner or breakfast. He was literally starving to death. You see, that gives that first temptation of turning a stone into bread a little more bite, doesn't it? And there's one more important detail that I want us to capture here. We learn from Matthew's gospel that when Jesus went into the desert, he went into the, into the desert to be tempted by Satan. It was as if Jesus was saying, bring it on, Satan. I've been waiting for over 4,000 years for this fight with you ever since you cast my creation into sin. And I'm here to fix it once and for all. So where God tells you and me and everyone else to flee temptation, Jesus met temptation head on. And that was done for us. So let's see what happened. Temptation number one. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. Now, again, at first glance, this might not seem like all that difficult of a temptation until we remember that he hadn't eaten anything for over a month. He was famished. And this is where Satan decided to attack first. Now, notice how he starts this temptation. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Here we see Jesus goading Jesus, or here we see Satan, I should say, goading Jesus into showing his power. And he certainly could have turned any of those stones into bread because he was God. But in essence, the devil was saying, prove it to me that you're God. You don't look like God. You don't look like God's son. But see, if Jesus would have given in to that temptation, he would not have been trusting his heavenly father to care for all of his bodily needs. That would have been similar to us saying something like, well, I don't have a job and I haven't eaten for a long time, so I'm going to take matters into my own hands and instead of trusting the Lord to take care of me, I'm going to start stealing food because of my situation. How easily we can justify not trusting God for everything, especially in the darkest of times. Now, let's just stop here for a moment. How does that apply to your life? When you're desperate, does does your trust in God simply go out the window? Do you find yourself complaining more? Or do you criticize God's working in your life if you're dissatisfied with how life is going? Though we often do, we we have to raise our hand and say, guilty, don't we? But Jesus didn't. And he actually had the power to do something about it. He could have easily turned those stones into piping hot, melted, buttered, homemade bread. After all, He had created the entire universe out of nothing. But see, Jesus continued to trust his Father. Where you and I, we often complain about what we don't have. The latest iPad, a nice car, a nice home, a computer with all the latest whistles and bells, and on and on the list goes. But Jesus didn't complain. Not one time. Throughout the whole ordeal, Jesus trusted implicitly 
his heavenly father. And he showed this quite clearly by his response. It is written, man does not live on bread alone. See, God's promise that he would care for him and provide for his needs, that's all that Jesus needed to know. And so he passed the first test. But the second test would be no easier. In the second temptation, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all of their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So here in this temptation, Satan moves from attempting to sow seeds of doubt in Jesus' mind about God's care and providence to an outright, bold-faced lie. He says that he has all the power in the world to do with as he pleases. And that he'll give it to Jesus. He'll give all of it to Jesus if he would just simply bow down and worship him. Well, first of all, that's a lie, of course. He doesn't have all the power. But the real temptation here for Jesus was to forego the road of pain and suffering that he knew lay ahead of him. It would have been so easy to just stop for a moment, give Satan a little worship, and then get all of that the world has to offer. In a similar way, how easy it is for us to live our lives and to go after all that the world has to offer us. I mean, it would be so much more fun, would it not, to hang out with the shady characters at school who always had the coolest parties. And if I get drunk, if I smoke some pot, I mean, what's the big deal? It would be so much easier in life. Life would go so much better if I would spend all of my waking moments earning money as the head of the household. Now, I know that means that I'm not going to be able to spend much time with my wife or my children, but hey, someone has to provide for them and pay all the bills. It wouldn't be such a big deal, would it? One little fling with a co-worker. Besides, no one needs to know, especially my spouse. See, it all sounds so easy, doesn't it? So harmless, so appealing. All temptations are that way. Except for one very important fact for you and for me, and that is God called you and me to live a godly life. A godly life which means saying no to getting drunk, no to drugs, no to being greedy, no to neglecting your family, no to breaking your marriage vows, no, no, no to the devil and to our sinful natures and to the world that surrounds us. See, God has called us for a heavenly purpose, not an earthly one. Besides, all temptations provide only temporary pleasures or satisfaction, and then comes the consequences, which are quite severe. And that easy, seductive kind of life can even lead us away from God himself and leave us worshiping the prince of this world, Satan. How often haven't we taken that forbidden fruit? The pleasures of this world, unfortunately, are ever so enticing. And our sinful natures love it. But Jesus didn't take the bait. He knew that his mission was not to live an easy life in this world, but to live a lowly life and eventually to suffer and die for sins that he didn't even commit. And so he quickly replies to Satan and to his bold lie, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Test number two passed. Then came the third temptation. The devil led Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift up, your, up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, 
do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Again, the devil resorted to tempting Jesus to show off his divine power and to prove that he is who he said he was by jumping off the highest point there in the temple. See, seeing the Lord's reliance, he saw how Jesus was using the word of God to combat him, so the devil thought he could play with Jesus with the, his, that same game. He thought he too could muster up some scripture and use that to try to support his temptation. Go ahead, Jesus, jump. God promises to send his angels to protect you, and you trust in God's word, right? So go ahead and jump. But Jesus demonstrates that he was far more a student of Scripture than Satan would ever be. In fact, Jesus is the Word of God incarnate. He is the Word made flesh. Yes, he should trust God to provide and care for him, which is exactly what, it, what he's been doing, not only through these temptations, but throughout the 40 days. But he shouldn't neglect taking care of himself so much that he's actually testing God. That would be like us daring God to protect us by jumping in front of a speeding locomotive. God never promised to protect us in that way. And Jesus said as much to Satan when he replied that the Bible teaches, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So temptation number three, pass with flying car. Now, there are a number of things that we can learn and should learn from Jesus here, but I want to focus just on three. Number one, did Jesus withstand Satan's temptations as God or as a man? Well, he did it as a man. A man using the powerful word of God, which Satan could not resist. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we have the power to resist the devil as well. Not power inherently, but when we use the very power of God, we too can resist. Of course, to do that, we have to know God's word, what it says, and not just know it, but to use it and to put it into practice and to make it part of our daily lives. Secondly, did Jesus choose the easy way out? Not at all. He chose the path of suffering and pain. And he did it all for you and for me. To go the way of the cross and to die for all of our, our, our sins. All of the times that we utterly failed to withstand Satan's temptations. But because he accomplished his mission. Was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And died on the cross to take away all of our sins. We now by faith, have a new life, one that is ruled by the Spirit of God, not by the, the spirit of this world, the devil. We, like Jesus, can also be filled with the Holy Spirit and withstand Satan's schemes by resisting him. How? With the power of God's Word. So again, we come back full circle, and I want you to think about your own life, your own situations. Do you regularly pick up the sword of the Spirit in your daily struggles against Satan, who, by the way, works in concert with our sinful natures and the sinful world around us? Or do you leave it where you put it last, perhaps on some shelf gathering dust? As one old coach used to say, if you want to get into the game, you've got to put your shoes on. Finally, when Satan tempts us, he won't be as obvious as he was when he showed up there in front of Jesus providing those temptations. Satan isn't going to tempt us with outright murder, but he will tempt us with envy and hatred and jealousy. He won't tempt you to throw your Bible into the trash can, but just not to use it. He won't tempt you to become the richest person in the world, just, just wealthy enough that you don't have to trust in God to care for you. And he might not tempt you to jump in bed with someone not your spouse, but he might tempt you to mistreat your spouse at home where no one can see. 
See, Satan's goal in any temptation is the same. To pull you away from a life that gives glory to God in exchange for a life of gratifying ourselves. And he hopes that if he can get you to do that often enough and long enough, he can get you off of God's team altogether. And let's be honest, all of us, Satan has been successful in getting us to scratch those itches. We have all failed our God, and we've all fallen to this temptation or that, but where we have failed, Jesus succeeded. He battled Satan in the wilderness, and he defeated him, how? With the word of God. And he would later go on to crush the devil's head and all of his power on Calvary's cross by shedding his blood to pay for all of our lost battles. And simply by believing in him, you have eternal life right now and forever. Amazing, isn't it? In spite of how often you and I have failed, yet heaven is ours. But it's all because Christ didn't fail. So as you enter another season of Lent to remember Jesus' perfect life, given for, given for you through his own suffering and death on the cross, is there anything that you would like to give up for Lent? And I know that some are going to give up this food or that. Some might even give up chocolate for Lent. But instead of giving up some food, why not give up the sin that Satan tempts us to commit? Stop scratching those itches. And why make it only for the season of Lent? Instead, live in the light of Christ, following his example as we live the Christ-centered lives that God has called us to live. Our appreciation for all that Jesus has done for us, it never runs out. And it, goes well, and it goes well beyond the 40 days of Lent. See, that's why we can truthfully say that Lent is for life. As we focus on the most beneficial giving up of all. A spiritual fasting for our entire lives. Saying no to the empty food that Satan offers and instead feasting upon the satisfying food Christ offered. Forgiveness, salvation, peace, and a brand new life to live for Him. And so when we consider all that Jesus has done for us personally, why would we settle for anything less than the very best? His amazing word and His amazing grace. May God's word dwell richly in all of us so that we are all fully armored and fully armed to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now the peace that passes all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite you to uh, make your presence known through the worship participation cards that you have there in the pew. Uh, we would uh, have you fill out the communion side if you're taking communion with us.